good evening everyone on the behalf of team dentist channel online i would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you i am dr aditi mishra and i'll be the host for today's session on the topic infection control in dental clinics by dr devki varma so before starting with the session i have few housekeeping notes to make if you have any doubts during the session you can put your questions in the question and answer box in your control panel and we'll be taking up each and every question at the end of the session and if you have joined us from facebook and youtube live you can ask us questions by commenting and we'll be answering them at the end of the session so without further ado i would like to introduce our today's speaker to everyone dr devki has completed her mbbs from christian medical college ludhiana and her md from school of medical science and research sharda university greater noida thereafter she has worked as a senior resident for 3 years in esic model hospital and pg institute new delhi she then joined as a consultant microbiology and hospital infection control office at mulchan hospital where she worked for for a year her core areas of work are bacteriology and hospital infection control and has published and presented papers in this regard welcome dr devki hi thank you aditi a very good evening everybody it is a privilege to be here amongst all of you today i thank Dr. Aditi Mishra for giving me this opportunity to speak on infection control in dental clinics, which is a topic very close to my heart, being a microbiologist. So now um, I look, I look forward to the interaction with all of you over the next sixty minutes. Yeah, infection control in dental clinics. so just to highlight the importance of dental infection control measures in private dental clinics i tried to find a study in india but i couldn't find a similar study so i'm quoting a study from lebanon which was done in 2017 to evaluate the infection control knowledge attitude and practice in dental clinics in lebanon so this was uh, the study was conducted over 1400 417 dentists and it is surprising that only 90% of them were vaccinated against hepatitis b So hepatitis B is again we can have this is something which is easily achievable as healthcare providers that is have hundred percent vaccination against hepatitis B. Sixty percent were routinely uh, uh, routinely did not ask the medical history from patients, which is again that is two thirds were only asking medical history. One third had no idea about their previous medical history, and only forty percent compliance was there for protective eyewear. protective eyewear is very essential especially in dentistry where there is a lot of chance for splashes and splatter of body fluids now most dental procedures require close contact with the patient's oral cavity saliva blood and respiratory tract in secretions hence all patients visiting a dental clinic must be considered as a potential source of infection and dental professionals must follow appropriate infection prevention control guidelines So infection control in dental clinics includes all levels and fields of dental practice and all persons involved in providing dental care directly or indirectly Infection control in the dental uh, in dentistry gained importance when in the late 1960s and 70s many patients were infected with hepatitis B virus by dentists and dental surgeons in the United States This also was only the beginning of infection control in dentistry it gained priority and was implemented after hiv infections reached epidemic proportions infection control further gained um, further momentum in the united states when dentists started turning positive after treating patients who had hiv and also other healthcare providers started getting infected infection with hiv while uh, looking after patients now modes of disease transmission in dentistry diseases can be transmitted from patient to patient dentist to patient patient to dentist when adequate precautions are not taken dental healthcare workers and patients can then further transmit the disease to their respective family and friends common modes of disease transmission are the most dreaded one that is the percutaneous transmission that is inoculation of microbes from blood and saliva transmitted through sharps then there is contact that is touching or exposing non intact skin to infective oral lesions infected tissue or infected blood including fluid splash and splatter of infected fluids 
Inhalation of aerosols, that is breathing of bioaerosols suspended in clinics, ambient air laden with infected material by using hand pieces, scalars or droplet nuclei from coughing. So this is by both by conducting the procedure or by simple coughing, that is the respiratory route. Indirect contact through formites, that, that is touching contaminated surface in the dental treatment room operatory. Now, disease transmission may vary depending upon the individual susceptibility, the virulence of the organism, infected dose, and modes of transmission. So basically, infection control deals with the breaking the chain of infection. Now, the most important, which I want to highlight, is standard precautions. Standard precautions are the minimum infection prevention practices that uh, apply to all patient care regardless of suspected or confirmed infection status of the patient in any setting where healthcare is being delivered. So these practices are designed for both to protect the dental healthcare provider and prevent them from spreading infection to the, amongst patients. So it is uh, to protect the um, dentist or the healthcare provider as well as the patient. Now, so I want to talk about these, which are the basic in any dental clinic in uh, and I'm going to talk about each one in further detail. So there is hand hygiene, use of PPE, personal protective equipment, respiratory hygiene, cough act etiquette, sharp safety, safe injection practices, sterile instruments and devices, clean and disinfected environmental surfaces, dental unit water quality, immunization against diseases, and biomedical waste management. Now, hand hygiene. Hand hygiene is the most important measure to prevent the spread of infections amongst patients and healthcare providers. Education and training is the only way where we can get maximum clients uh, compliance to hand hygiene. So for routine examinations and non-surgical procedure, procedures, you can use water and plain soap or antimicrobial soap that is called antisepsis, or you can use alcohol-based hand rub. So the uh, two important facts that you need to remember here is that if we do not uh, use a bar soap, we use liquid soap, and we only, uh, we can use alcohol-based hand rubs at all times, except when the hands are visibly soiled, you have to wash with soap and water. For surgical procedures, you perform a complete hand scrub before you put on sterile gloves. Uh, I have shown the picture of the WHO methods of hand hygiene, which I think everybody would know. Now, when to perform hand hygiene, everybody will know that there are five moments of hand hygiene before seeing the patient, after seeing the patient, before touching any equipment or materials, that will be touching the patient before touching any uh, fluids associated with the uh, patient and before putting on gloves and immediately after uh, removing gloves. Now, PPE refers to any wearable equipment that is designed to protect the healthcare provider from exposure to or contact with infectious agents. So obviously, we with the COVID pandemic, all of us know what is PPE. It includes a face mask, face shield, eyewear, gloves, gown, shoe cover. So now... Uh, examples of appropriate use of PPE are, uh, for uh, adherence to standard precautions include use of protective clothing to protect the skin and clothing during procedures or activities where contact where we are anticipated. So you will definitely wear a PPE. Then you will cover the mouth, nose and eye protection during procedures that are likely to have splashes or sprays of blood or other fluids. Then you uh, the other important fact is that a dental healthcare provider should know how to don and doff a PPE and should know how to dispose the PPE. And definitely the most important is hand hygiene is always the final step after removing and disposing of the PPE. So the key recommendations are that do not wear the same pair of gloves when you're handling more than one patient. Do not wash the gloves. They are always disposable. They're not to be reused. And remove the PPE before leaving the work area. So I'm just highlighting the points where I feel I have seen um, healthcare providers make mistakes. Now, respiratory etiquettes and uh, respiratory hygiene and cough etiquettes. So transmission of uh, respiratory pathogens, that is the transmission of respiratory pathogens with, uh, that spread by droplet or airborne nuclei. So this is um, either the patient or the patient's relative or the healthcare provider can be asymptomatic or have signs of illness like cough, congestion, running nose, or and be producing respiratory secretions and can be infectious. So again, for most of these things, the standard method is training and education of the patient, the staff, and the healthcare providers. The key recommendations is that post signs at an education, right? 
post signs at um, entrances with instructions to patients with symptoms of respiratory infection to cover their mouth, nose while coughing and sneezing, use disposable tissues, where to discard the tissues, and of course, perform hand hygiene once they are done. Now offer masks or to coughing patients and other symptomatic persons when they enter the dental setting. So obviously this is a pre-COVID area we're discussing. In COVID, everyone is wearing masks and I think everyone knows the respiratory hygiene and cough etiquettes. But still I'm assuming in times now when we COVID is in the back bench, that is when these need to be again highlighted. So educate the healthcare provider on the importance of infection prevention methods to contain respiratory secretions to prevent the spread of respiratory pathogens when examining and caring of patients with signs and symptoms of respiratory infection. Now, uh, sharp safety. So most percutaneous injuries among dental health care providers involve either burrs, needles, or sharp in instruments, and these are preventable. Therefore, they should have policies and procedures in place for sharp uh, safety. And you also need to know the risk of injury when you are exposed to sharps. So whenever possible, there are two types of methods, either engineering controls or work practice controls. So engineering controls, are uh, they remove or isolate the hazard in the workplace and are frequently technology-based, like using self-sheathing anesthetic needles, safety scalpels, needleless IV ports, or sharps containers. So where you don't have engineering controls, you use work practice controls, which is basically behavioral modification to reduce the risk of blood exposure by changing the way the, DS, uh, the dental healthcare provider performs tasks. So example, not bending or breaking needles before disposal, not passing a syringe without an unsheathed needle by hand, removing burrs before dissembling the handpiece from the dental unit, using instruments in place, uh, in place of fingers for tissue retraction or palpation during suturing and administration of anesthesia. All used disposable syringes and needles, scalpel blades, and other sharp items should be placed in puncture-resistant containers located close to the area where they are used. So these are very small things, but any shortcut we uh, use can cause a, a sharp injury. So now recommendations is do not recap. It is standard that wherever possible, do not recap any sharp devices like needles. However, when you need to recap, Use either a one-handed scoop technique or a mechanical device designed for holding the needle cap when recapping. That is, sometimes when you're putting multiple injections and before removing a, a non-disposable aspirating syringe. Now, we come to safe injection practices. Are intended to prevent the transmission of infectious diseases between one patient to another or between a patient and dental healthcare provider during preparation and administration of parenteral medications. So there is a standard rule, one needle, one syringe, and only one time for disposable syringe needle concept, we, there are not to be used, reused. However, we see when you use a single syringe with or without the same needle for administration of medication to multiple patients, when reinsertion of a used syringe with or without the same needle into a medication vial or solution container like saline for, uh, to obtain additional medication for a single patient and then using that vial for another patient or when you're preparing uh, medications near in contaminated areas. So the general recommendations which I would like to highlight are that use a dedicated multi-dose vial to a single patient whenever possible. If multi-dose vial will be used for more than one patient, it should be restricted to a centralized medi medication area. If multi-dose vial enters the immediate patient treatment area, it should be dedicated for a single patient and discarded immediately. If this is also not possible, then you must open the uh, you must mention the date of opening and discard within 28 days or according to the manufacturer's in uh, instructions. Now, sterilization and disinfection. So each den uh, dental practice should have policies and procedures for containing, transporting, and handling instruments and equipment that may be contaminated with blood or other fluids. Right now, if we see um, the use of single-use devices for one patient only and dispose of uh, dispose them appropriately, this is something that is why I have put a question mark because number one, in a developing country like ours. Always using single-use devices is not pocket-friendly. So sometimes we use devices which are known to which the manufacturer provides us with instructions instructions for multiple uses because they're expensive. 
also there is a hazard for environmental pollution so i think this is a very uh, policy based um, top uh, policy based uh, decision to be made so cleaning disinfection and sterilization of dental equipment should be assigned to dental healthcare providers with training in the required reprocessing steps to ensure reprocessing results in the device that can be safely used for patient care now patient care items can be divided into three critical semi critical and non critical depending on the potential risk associated with the intended use so critical is what's it critical is um, used that is that uh, they penetrate the soft tissue and bone and for these we need to you uh, the only method of sterilization is through an autoclave that is basically we need steam sterilization and these include surgical instruments and uh, periodontal scalers now um, if you come to semi critical they come in contact with mucous membranes or non intact skin they are like exposed skin or chapped skin in case of dermatitis they have a lower risk of transmission and they can be sterilized or you can use a high level disinfectant however dental hand pieces and associated attachments like low speed motors reusable prophylactic angles should always be heat sterilized between patients and not just a high level of uh, surface disinfectant because these devices are semi critical but studies show that their internal surfaces can be contaminated with patient materials and there can be biofilm formation so they have to be sterilized accordingly with steam sterilization not dry sterilization not uh, by a high level disinfectant now uh, so um, instruments include mouth mirrors and reusable dental impression trays now non criticals are those that come in contact with intact skin they provide a low risk of infection they you can just um, these can be cleaned or if visibly soiled clean with a disinfectant and these are, you can also protect them by using disposable barriers example radiographic heads or cones bp cuffs now uh, this is something that um, i'm sure a lot of you would be aware of that automated cleaning equipment that is ultrasonic cleaners washer disinfectors they help to remove the debris and finer microscopic um, material that is present in the instruments after cleaning the instrument should be dried and inspected because if the instrument is slightly damaged again the damage area is of area for biofilm formation wrapped placed um, packed and placed in container systems and packages should be Labeled to show which sterilizer, what is the cycle, so to trace back any flaw that happens. Now, what is the event of a sterilization failure, which is where I think the core importance lies. So, we sterilization can be monitored by biological, mechanical, or chemical methods. Now, if you look at the biological method, biological indicators or spore tests, as they are called, I put a picture alongside, are the most accepted method for monitoring sterilization as a process. because it will see that when the autoclave has been shut or when the eto is being done it has reached a particular temperature pressure for a particular time by killing the heat resistant microorganisms which is geobacillus or bacillus that is instilled in these small tubes so spore test should be done weekly now if you see these tubes the basic uh, principle behind them is if the sterilization process has happened adequately then the spore is resistant it is dead so when you try to regrow it you will not be able to obtain it however if the sterilization process did not happen adequately you can grow the bacillus and the due to when the bacillus starts multiplying there will be a change in ph and from purple the tube will turn into yellow color mechanical and chemical indicators do not guarantee your sterilization as a process but they detect procedural errors and equipment malfunctions so the biological indicator you will take 24 to 48 hours to know the report these are more immediate and knowing if sterilization has taken place so mechanical monitoring is very simple that is seeing the sterilizer gauges the computer displays print out seeing that adequate temperature pressure it is more so mechanically observing that everything is in place chemical monitoring is more sensitive to see that uh, the chemical changes that take place at higher temperatures so th this include these chemical indicator tapes and strips which are used within every package inside outside to see if the sterilization the heat is penetrated inside as well as on top so it is placed inside every package and you have to see appropriate change in color so whenever as a dental healthcare provider you are using a sterile instrument you have to see it has to be inspected before opening to ensure that the packaging material material has not been compromised that is whether it is um, uh, 
wet torn or punctured and if it has been compromised it has to be re-sterilized and cannot be used for patient care now uh, the general recommendation is that you have to when you are re reusing or reprocessing reusable dental instrument you have to follow the manufacturer instructions if it says it can be reused re only 10 times do not do it 20 times if it's five times do not make it 10 times wear pp when you're handling contaminated instruments now environmental uh, disinfection and cleaning policies for routine cleaning and disinfection should be a part of every infection control program cleaning removes the large number of microorganisms disinfection is generally a less lethal process it's not the same as sterilization but cleaning is always followed is usually followed by disinfection so cleaning is and disinfection should be done of the highly touched surfaces which are the biggest source of infections because you touch them the maximum like whether they are handles, light handles, light trays, your light bra uh, bra uh, bracket trays, switching on dental units, computer equipment, the chair handles, all these as shown in the picture. These surfaces are touched, the microorganisms are transferred to other surfaces or to the instruments or to the nose, mouth, eyes, hands of the healthcare provider or even patient. So hand hygiene, again, as I would say, is the most important key role in preventing this. Now we come to the dental unit water uh, quality. Again, this is uh, essential because I feel the dental water lines are used and are constantly used. So maintaining them is essential because there is plastic tubing which, uh, that carries water to high speeds in the hand, uh, hand piece. There are air water syringes and ultrasonic stages. They all promote bacterial growth and development of biofilm. Because they are long, they are narrow, typical area for a habitat for microorganisms. So all dental units sh should use systems that treat water to meet the drinking water standards that is less than 500 colony forming units per ml of heterotrophic water bacteria. Now immunization, any healthcare pro uh, provider should be checked that is he is immunized for the basic vaccines that is hepatitis A, B, varicella, MMR, DPD then rubella, meningitis, polio. And obviously the two latest ones was in, uh, seasonally every year in uh, the flu vaccine and now obviously for COVID. Then biomedical waste management. I think the most important waste generated in dental clinics is either human anatomical waste or the general plastic waste, that is your gloves, masks, all of that. And there is definitely sharps. So human anatomical waste can be incinerated the, uh, and thrown in yellow. The plastic waste cannot be uh, incinerated. It's recyclable and it will go through micro or hydro, um, this thing, or to landfills and it's gone, it goes in reds. Now, one thing that, I, that is my last part of the lecture, which is, I know it's been two years of the pandemic, but I want to highlight the national guidelines. These are very good by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare for, for guidelines for dental clinics in COVID-19 pandemic. So it has classified patients into low risk patients and high risk patients. So patients who are vaccinated, no active COVID-19 or RT-PCR negative, or who have had 14 days of exposure, all of these are to be all dental procedures can take place with standard appropriate precautions. If you have high risk patients, which are they're symptomatic or RAT or RT-PCR positive, only emergency procedures should be undertaken with COVID protocol and facilities of these are not appropriate, high-risk patients can be referred to a higher center. The government has highlighted the use of teleconsultation because to uh, identify only patients that need to come physically to clinics, appointment-based systems, so you can have spacing out of patient, one patient at one time, no relatives, if possible, without attendant. Screening of patients at the OPD or dental clinic entry, that is screen for patients of any symptoms of COVID to minimize the exposure of staffs and other patients. Waiting area to install glass plastic barriers, ensure availability of three-layered mask and hand sanitizer and paper tissue at registration desk, ensure physical distancing of um, six feet wherever possible, uh, all areas to be free of any formized magazines, toys, TV remotes, similar articles, and wherever possible to have cashless. So this is my lecture and um, I'd like to thank you and we can be open to any uh, question answers now. Sure, ma'am. So I request all the participants, if you have any doubts, uh, you can just drop your questions in the question and answer box so that we can take up one by one. And uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for this amazing session. So before moving on to the question and answer session, uh, I will be introducing our organization to all the participants.
So this is our organization, Dentist Channel Online with the motto, Healthy Smiles, Wealthy Lives. We have come up with a brand new website, www.dentistchannel.online. So you can log on to our website and find all the information, uh, everything there. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, WhatsApp, Telegram, everywhere. And we are proud to announce that we are the first digital dental media marketing company which is catering to academic, professional and commercial needs of all the dental students, practitioners, organizations, businesses and dental industry leaders. And being our prime member, you can avail a lot of benefits. You will be receiving e-certificate which will be containing one FDA Germany CE point which is exclusively for the prime members. The annual prime membership will cost just 799 rupees and if you use my code which is uh, ADT100, you will be availing a discount. So, uh, I request participants to kindly subscribe to our prime membership. We are coming up with a lot of webinars and a lot of sessions uh, this month, so stay tuned with us. And for all the latest updates, you can just uh, text your complete name on this number and we'll be adding you to our broadcast list so that you're uh, uh, updated regarding each and every upcoming event that we have. So our sponsors, Nova Mind GmbH, they provide the innovative dental and healthcare solutions to ensure our success. So they have generic implants and prosthetic solutions. Recording, if uh, in case you have missed out our live session, you can go back to Facebook and YouTube channel and uh, watch the recorded sessions there. Okay, so before closing the session, ma'am, uh, any takeaway note for our participants? I think just to tell everybody how important infection control in dental clinics is, especially after COVID, I think it has already been highlighted. But these are small basic steps which everyone can do to protect themselves as well as the patients, as well as their families. So, and obviously the most important is hand hygiene, always. So, thank you so much, ma'am, for this amazing session. And I'm sure all thank the dental fraternity has been enlightened with the, this information and will be taking care of each and everything during this. Uh, uh, I would say, pre, not uh, we are oh, post uh, pandemic, we are still in the pandemic. In pandemic yes. Yeah. So, thank you so much, ma'am, for being with thank us. Thank you. And uh, with this, we'll be ending our today's session. Thank you and have a great evening ahead. Thank you.